think of when Rick was talking about his nice search from the Crown Grant. In our office at the moment, we have a lovely search from the Crown Grant, and the title flows absolutely beautifully into the hands of the current owners. There just is one slight problem. This whole title is some several hundred feet from where the cottage is that they've been occupying all this time. And since the cottage is on unpatented land, doesn't matter how long they've been there, they have no title. Um, join us next year and I'll tell you if I was able to sort that one out. It's my problem at the moment. As you are aware, the search of title is only half the battle. We've got other searches and we've got many other searches. You'll see in the reference material um, a note of the little booklet called Losing Ground. It has a perfectly delightful cover. It's got a tiny little piece of land and sitting on top of the only piece of land in sight is a house. And the little booklet goes on to list some of the 200 statutes in Ontario that affect land and it divides them up into happy things like uh, these statutes will cost you the forfeit of your land and these statutes will end up with no title and these statutes result in one of the 25 first liens that Her Majesty can have and other consoling information. And to tell us about this is Tony Peckham from Barry, who tells me that he was born at a very early age in Windsor, Ontario and he's been drifting east and north ever since along with our prevailing winds. 15 years stay in Toronto got him his degrees in arts and law and um, a call to the bar in 1972. However, he thereafter moved into what he tells us is Ontario's most progressive city, Barrie, and joined a firm which is medium large or medium small, depending on how he describes it. He tells us the following, that he has lectured or taught in other areas of law, and I know he has because I've worked with him. This is the first time anybody's allowed him to say anything about practice. And he says the reason he's qualified is that he has a few real estate transactions on his desk and that the firm up to date hasn't opened a complaint department. Let's see. Thank you. I hope no one here wants to open a complaint department after I'm finished. Um, I call this Ghosts in the Title, partly to give it a little romance by relating it to the supernatural, and partly because these are real ghosts, and there is little other theme to this lecture. In fact, what I'm going to talk about are liens, charges, directives, liabilities, restrictions affecting property rights that constitute uh, a hodgepodge of things that are not disclosed by the abstract of title and must be sought elsewhere than the registry office. With that, I will jump into a list of some 20 or so that I wish to mention. Now, I'm not going to suggest that on every transaction you have to send out 20 letters but I think that a lot of these are germane to most. Uh, I was embarrassed to start with realty taxes because I thought that was so fundamental that no one would uh, not write for a tax certificate. In talking to Rick Angleson before the lecture, he advised me he's used agents or dealt, had dealings where in other cities where lawyers do it simply by telephone. Well, I don't think that's acceptable and a tax certificate is de rigueur. There is a potential for a lien on the land, not only for arrears of taxes, uh, but for a myriad of other charges as well, which can be added to the tax roll. Now, it may be superfluous to mention these in the letter asking for a tax certificate, but I would suggest that in writing for a tax certificate, you do request not only the current taxes and the arrears of taxes and the local improvements, but perhaps make reference to the other statutes which may uh, create a lien on the land chargeable in the same manner as taxes. I've listed some of these in the materials. This is by no means exhaustive. Uh, some of them are pretty obscure. The Telephone Act, for example, is only where there is a municipal telephone system. I assume there still are some in Ontario, but I don't know where. The Weed Control Act could be of some importance uh, in a, a rural setting, and certainly the Shoreline Property Assistance Act, while it may not uh, be of much value in downtown North York, would be of some use along Lake Simcoe. I would also suggest perhaps you add any other charges forming a lien by the municipal municipality against the property. 
this might at least draw the attention of the municipality to the fact that they might have something else they want to add to the tax certificate. Where the land is in an unorganized municipality, that is a territory without municipal organization, the search is conducted at the Ministry of Revenue in, Tor in Toronto, and shortly it will be in Oshawa, I understand. There is an address for you uh, in the uh, letters which start at page 31. Care must be taken if land has recently, and I don't know how recent recently is, but if land has recently gone from an area without municipal organization into one with municipal organization, there is a potential for that lien by the province still being in existence, but it would not be disclosed by the municipal tax certificate. In that case, you have to do two searches. Farm tax reduction, again, won't be very relevant if you're buying in downtown Toronto, but it is relevant where you're buying vacant land that may have been benefited from uh, the farm tax reduction program or the managed forest tax reduction program. Firstly, you will want to check on that because any subsidy that is being received by the vendor, you will wish to have adjusted between vendor and purchaser. Secondly, there is a potential problem if a purchaser is intending to develop the land for residential, industrial, or commercial purposes. Such development will cause a reassessment against the owner, and that uh, with interest, which I believe is currently at 10 percent, and that is for the previous nine years, the current year and the previous nine years. So that is something that could be a hidden cost to somebody who has plans for some farmland. Fourthly, I'd like to mention utilities, which again is, is rather trite. Um, these public utilities uh, can give rise to a lien against the land for unpaid charges. I would suggest, based on my experience, that you search even where the land is vacant. I had the experience once of having purchased a, a building lot uh, in the countryside. It was vacant land, and uh, at least I, I thought it was. My client told me it was. It had had a shack on it, which I didn't know, and I guess my client didn't know, or perhaps didn't consider relevant. There were some outstanding hydro charges, which fortunately I managed to get from the vendor after closing. However, in the interim, they had been added to the tax bill. Charges for water also comprise a public utility and should be searched. At present, natural and artificial gas are supplied by private utilities and therefore do not give rise to a lien against the land. However, I would suggest you search your right to the gas department as well to save an argument after closing with the gas company or with the vendor's lawyer. It's uh, easier to arrange for a reading. Hydro easements should also be searched and there's a form letter which the um, Power Commission likes to receive in exactly that form. Uh, Section 43 of the Power Commission Act uh, gives binding effect to unregistered easements in favor of the Commission throughout Ontario. Therefore, uh, search should be made and inspection should also be requested. Uh, to indicate the carelessness of the Commission, uh, I recently searched quite a number of lots in Simcoe County, uh, 17 in all, which were abutting one another, and there was, in fact, a hydro easement running right across the middle of it. I think it was perhaps mm -hmm. crucial to those cottages and others in the area. They had only registered it against two of the lots, but it was across all of them. Zoning. Zoning is also important that it be searched, but I think it is the solicitor's responsibility to examine the survey, and hopefully there is one, to ensure compliance with the relevant zoning bylaw. Most municipalities uh, will not certify that the existing use or the building complies. Now some, some I believe still do, but I know with quite a number that did in the past they won't anymore. It may be difficult in some circumstances to know if it, if the uh, use or building complies, for example, where there is a minimum square footage requirement uh, on per unit in multiple units and you are purchasing a triplex. 
there's no way you can tell from a survey. Somebody has to go in and actually measure. If there are discrepancies, of course, you will wish to search further uh, to satisfy yourself that the building is a legal non-conforming use or that a minor variance has been given permitting the discrepancies. Of course, your initial step will be a letter of requisition with respect to the problems you encounter. The other thing I'd just like to mention about letters of zoning compliance issued by municipalities, I am not entirely sure that those, uh, a municipality is stopped by the issuance of such a letter from enforcing its zoning bylaw. I am aware of one case where a letter of that type was issued, the use was illegal, and uh, the lawyer involved was sued for ne negligence. He managed to uh, win the case simply because he had this, this letter from the municipality. <clears throat> But apparently the municipality was not stopped from enforcing its bylaw. Therefore, I do think it is the solicitor's responsibility as well. Ontario Heritage Act. This is something that probably most of you from Toronto are more familiar with than I am. But it is an important search when you are purchasing an older property. A building may be designated under sections 33 and 34 of the Act which would cause some difficulties if there are plans to demolish or to alter the property. The clerk of the municipality is required to maintain a register of all such properties designated and on payment of a fee will issue extracts with respect to what the designation is about. It may be that even if designated the property can be used or altered in a manner that is satisfactory to your client. In examining this, I came across Part 6 of the Ontario Heritage Act, which I really hadn't directed my mind to before. Uh, part 6 prevents excavation or alter alteration of properties of archaeological or historical significance that are designated by the Ministry of, of Culture and Recreation. Now, this could affect almost any kind of land from my standpoint, I would be more concerned about farmland than anything in, in the nature of a fort or, uh, or an ancient uh, ruin. Um, I thought when I read this, I, uh, first of all, I saw that there was a requirement for registration of notice on title, which would assist you in most cases because there it is right in the registry office. However, I thought, what happens if you're buying from somebody who's hot to sell because he's got notice that his property is going to be designated? It wouldn't be in the registry office. How do you search? I called the Ministry of Culture and Recreation and spoke to a lawyer there, and he gave me good news and bad news. The good news was that as of December 1980, no properties in Ontario had been designated under this part of the Ontario Heritage Act. The bad news was if they planned to designate a property, they wouldn't tell you. You could write them a letter, but you wouldn't get an answer. They are very concerned with vandalism and looters, and so that's a problem that you probably cannot solve. Work orders. These can arise from several sources, the municipality, the fire department, the local health unit, unit being the commonest authorities to be searched. The owner's consent is a prerequisite to getting details of the work order, and um, there is a form in the materials after page 31 um, uh, for consent of an owner to getting uh, what's on file. Now usually the municipality will tell you if they have a file open, but that's about as far as they'll go without this consent. Uh, the fact that a building is relatively new shouldn't really stop you from uh, searching work orders. If there has been any error in the inspections carried out in building or rebuilding, for example after a fire, they will issue a work order. This uh, happened in a case I was involved in about half a dozen years ago, and uh, I was advancing the money from the mortgagee on a, a rebuilding after a fire, and I've, I don't know how I even thought of it, but I did check work orders, and uh, found out there was one, and I asked the building inspector, what needs to be done to rectify it? He said, rip all the work apart and let us inspect it as it goes up. So I think that that, that is um, something that you should be wary of even where a building is relatively new. With the health unit, uh, you may be interested, of course, if you're buying an apartment building and it has a swimming pool or something along those lines, or if you're buying a restaurant, 
certainly you'll be concerned about anything they may uh, want to direct you to do. Uh, in the case of rural properties, you will also want to know about the septic system. Firstly, to ensure that, that it is built in compliance with the regulations, and secondly, to find out where it is, because uh, your client, the purchaser, is going to have to service that septic tank afterwards, and if he digs around and destroys the tile bed, it's going to be of some expense to him. Subdivision agreement. I've never really been satisfied with the answers I get on subdivision agreements. Usually, I think you requisition a release from the agreement. The uh, vendor solicitor says, satisfy yourself as to compliance. So you write the municipality, and they tell you that there has been compliance to date. That doesn't mean it's completed. And that they have sufficient security. Now, I think that in the uh, bigger centers, there the municipalities are pretty careful about the kind of security they take. They usually get a letter of credit, and presumably if there is default, they could complete. I've never been involved in anything along those lines, so I don't know. However, inexperienced rural municipalities frequently take, as security, lots on the plan. When the subdivider defaults, a couple of things happen. One, the municipality does nothing. They've got a couple of lots on an incomplete plan of subdivision they don't want to spend the money to complete it. Building permits won't be issued on the lots uh, that are on the plan, and anybody who has bought a house has to suffer through with inadequate services. There are several of such subdivisions around Ontario that I'm aware of. However, I think you do have to take the municipality's word as to the uh, security being satisfactory. Wells. If you are buying a rural property, I think it's important to obtain a well driller certificate showing the rate of flow of water from the well. Clearly, you won't be able to get this if it's a dug well. If the well was installed in the distant past, or maybe even in the recent past, you may wish to have a new inspection as to flow and quality of water. This, of course, requires the cooperation of the vendor. Uh, many institutional lenders require a well driller certificate as a condition of advancing on a mortgage. I do have an address for you for some well driller certificates in the material in the letters. Uh, the Ministry of the Environment in Don Mills has many well driller certificates issued after 1968. The only wrinkle to that is you would have to know who drilled the well because you not only require a description of the property but also the owner for whom it was uh, for whom the work was done. Conservation authorities. I have a wonderful map here that Miriam Kelly provided that shows in color all the conservation authorities in southern Ontario, well, I guess in northern Ontario as well. And you can see, when I first looked at it, I almost thought it was a county map with the boundaries drawn incorrectly. They're all over the place. There's practically no part of southern Ontario that does not have a conservation authority. The conservation authorities are creeping into the municipal bylaws with respect to issuance of building permits where lands may be in a floodplain. And in addition, they may have a hard look at the uses of, of buildings and structures um, and restrict such uses. I always write them a letter and ask them if they have any kind of directive, order, file, complaint, or anything dealing with the property. I always seem to get a telephone call. What do you want? So I dictate a letter to them. But I think it is prudent to, uh, to contact a conservation authority where your client is buying in one of these special areas designated under a bylaw. Uh, you may find, although you may not be do, able to do anything about it, that your client is buying a cottage, for example, in hopes of adding a beautiful sun porch, and uh, that just isn't going to happen because in the eyes of the conservation authority, that's another bedroom. Navigable waters. Uh, if, if your transaction includes the bed of navigable waters, or sorry, the bed uh, where there is uh, a body of water, 
you will want to, to search at the local Ministry of Natural Resources to ascertain if the, the body of water is considered navigable. Now, I don't really understand how the ministry operates. I have a feeling that they run around and by decree just say this is a navigable water. The answer you will get is usually something along the lines. Uh, we do not consider uh, that part of uh, XYZ Creek to be a navigable water for administrative purposes. I've always been tempted to write back and say, but what about for legal purposes? Uh, I don't know what administrative purposes means, but I think that it, it's as much as you will get out of them. Now, the answer you get can affect a number of things. First of all, the title to the uh, land under the body of water, and secondly, it may also affect your view of the legality of a dock or boathouse on the, on the uh, body of water, or the right to use, uh, to ride a, drive a boat on the body of water. So it may be in your interest to try to have, in some circumstance, circumstances, to have the ministry declare a body a navigable water. Corporate status. Rick has, has mentioned this, and uh, my comments are much the same. You have to uh, write to ascertain if a corporation was in existence when it, during its uh, tenure on title because there are provisions in the Business Corporations Act and in the Canada Business Corporations Act, and I presume in their predecessors, although I haven't checked on that, uh, providing for forfeiture or as cheat to the Crown. There are a number of grounds for revocation of charters, and uh, with federal charters, I would suggest you be especially careful because there was a magic date last December when, unless a, a federal corporation filed for uh, certificate of continuance, its charter vanished. Um, I also draw your attention to the provisions of the Mortmain and Charitable Uses Act, which Rick uh, did as well, where under Section 7 and 10 uh, there can be a disappearance of title. The Drainage Act is perhaps an obscure statute, and I mention it only out of an abundance of caution. <coughs> It's a very complicated statute for what it does. It has 128 sections, and the easiest way to, to learn what's in it is to get the uh, pamphlet from the Ministry of Agricultural, Agriculture and Food on drainage law, which I've mentioned in the materials. Uh, the only reason I suggest you write with respect to the Drainage Act is that it's possible that you're buying from somebody who has been involved in the preliminary stages of a drainage scheme. It doesn't show up on title. There are no assessments on the realty taxes, so you want to know what's going on on that property. Environmental Protection Act. Um, again, an area where I'm not sure that you get a satisfactory answer from the, the people involved. Uh, the minister or director uh, are to maintain an index for orders against properties, and of course you should write and ask if they have any orders naming the vendor of a property, or I suppose you might even name a predecessor and title if you were suspicious. Uh, my personal experience is that the offending activity usually hasn't come to light. You close, then it comes to light. And uh, of course, you are not protected under any circumstances by a letter from the ministry. <clears throat> If you are purchasing property that is near a controlled access highway, there are a number of things that could constitute a breach under the Highway Improvement Act, and therefore I would suggest you write to the regional office of the MTC to ensure that there are no breaches outstanding. Now, they might even be kind enough to go and do an inspection and, and give the vendor a lot of trouble when they see what's there. Uh, the uh, extent of their control, I haven't put the distances down, and I don't recall them offhand, but it's, it's not right necessarily right adjacent to the highway. But the number of things that can be offensive under this act is substantial, and it includes things like trees and shrubs, hedges, and pole lines. So I think it is important to check the distances when you're near, say, Highway 400 or 401. With any other King's Highway, if access is by the highway, 
uh, there should be uh, a letter sent to the MTC and a request for uh, a request as to whether the entrance is legal or not. In addition, you may you may requisition the um, entrance certificate from the vendor, although in a lot of cases there isn't one issued. For example, if a, a farm gate has been there for 30 years, there's unlikely to be an entrance permit. However, I do want to point out, because I've, I've got clients with these things, there are quite a few illegal entrances on highways around Ontario, and the MTC doesn't do anything about them. Personal Property Security Act is uh, of importance if you're purchasing any chattels. I understand that it's searched at 555 Young Street in Toronto. Outside of the city, it's searched by a telephone in the local registry office. Since it's e relatively easy to make a mistake with a birth date, I suggest you just use the, the vendor's name only when you're doing your initial search. And if there are similar names, then request that the vendor satisfy you that the chattels are not encumbered. Uh, my mention here of the Farm Loan Act may win me a prize for obscurity. Uh, I had never heard of the Farm Loan Act. I don't even know where I dredged it up. But it, it provides for a lien against certain types of farm assets to be filed with the clerk of the county court. And there is a limitation on the amount, $2,000. The loan has to be made by an agricultural association. And the only thing I can think of is that these are a rather rare beast around Ontario. However, I thought I should mention it. If you're purchasing farm assets, do search it. Section 178 of the Bank Act, formerly Section 8, is probably familiar to you. And if you are purchasing uh, a farm and you're, you're buying certain types of assets, uh, you should conduct a search at 250 University Avenue in Toronto to ensure that they are not encumbered by the bank. Executions has been mentioned by Rick, so I will skip that. Bankruptcy certificate. Well, um, it's common with lenders to search bankruptcy uh, against a borrower. I, it is not a necessary thing to do uh, where you're purchasing or even where you're lending money. Section 53 of the Bankruptcy Act provides protection for a good faith purchaser for value without notice. So unless the purchaser has actual notice of the vendor's bankruptcy or unless a trustee has registered on title, you can take title free of any concern. Residential Prem Premises Rent Review Act. This is one that I almost missed. Someone was kind enough to call me about it. Uh, in speaking to a number of other solicitors, I have discovered that it is not a common practice to search uh, where rental property is being purchased, and most people rely on the assignments uh, and other documentation, such as warranties and acknowledgments, to ensure that the uh, rent review legislation will not be invoked. Uh, I think it is important if you're buying land subject to residential tenancies that you write the local residential tenancy commission and ask them if they have anything on file or if there are any orders or pending applications with respect to rent review. The fact, however, that the residential tenancy commission advises you that it has no file does not prevent an application from successfully being made after closing and accordingly I do suggest you get all the other documents you may have been getting in the meantime. Boilers and pressure vessels. This is likely only to arise if you're buying a hotel or something that has a, a, a large boiler in it. And you would requisition the most recent certificate of inspection from the vendor as well as um, requesting that a new inspection be done. Uh, and of course the consent of the vendor is required for that. Similarly with elevators uh, you will require an inspection. This does not apply to private dwelling houses if, if there is an elevator in it. It does not have to be inspected under the Act but would apply certainly in an apartment building. In addition to these searches you will also wish to ensure the solicitor for the vendor satisfies you 
with respect to Section 116 of the Income Tax Act, and uh, I'd wish to point out that uh, the certificate issued under Section 116 is good only for 30 days. Uh, the relevant provisions of the Family Law Reform Act and any searches required by the Succession Law Reform Act. As well, if a business is being purchased, you will also requisition production and delivery of a certificate under Section 4 of the Retail Sales Tax Act. You may also wish to check the Bulk Sales Act and the Bills of Sale Act. I haven't mentioned those in the written material. There are sample letters provided, as I said. I don't want you to consider those as having been engraved on stone. They are only uh, samples, and uh, you will wish to tailor what you do to your own particular transaction and uh, to your own particular style. Now, the number of searches to be made is only likely to increase, so this material will probably be expanding. And clearly, at present, the responses we get are not entirely satisfactory. There are certain matters that cannot be searched. For example, I am involved right now with an apartment building that has methane gas bubbling up through the ground, and uh, the purchase was relatively recent. All the authorities gave a perfectly clean bill of health to it, but of course it was built on a dump. That wasn't disclosed by the abstract of title either. Similarly, the Endangered Species Act prohibits destruction or interference with the habitat of any species of fauna or flora declared by regulation to be threatened with extinction. I don't know of any way of searching uh, to ensure that uh, your client is not purchasing something that he can do nothing with. So all I'll say is good luck with the ghosts. I hope you don't encounter any, and certainly that you don't have to exercise any at your own expense. Thank you very much. I always hate that kind of a lecture. I think, gee, I don't, I don't remember searching that. When you get out to Brampton, they have these lovely maps about searching around the airport. You can only have a house so high, this close to the airport, and this high. And they give you the, in the uh, elevation from uh, sea level. But that's never on your survey, and you don't know whether you've, you're in trouble or not. For those of you who wish to make your own concordance, if you turn to the front page of Tony's lecture, that's lecture number H. Realty tax, you will find your um, appropriate letter in the workbook starting at page 31. Provincial land tax at page 52 of the workbook. Farm tax reduction, page 53 of the workbook. Utilities, pages 44 through 47, all in the workbook. Hydro easements, 57 to 60, and you'll see in there they, that, that the um, Hydro has given us a map. They've divided the province into areas. They've told us the addresses, and they've told us the letter they want. You will ask them to make an on-site inspection. You will get back letter number 22 that says, do you want an on-site inspection? The uh, zoning, you will find pages 38 and 40. Ontario Heritage Act, page 55, 71, 72, work orders, page 39, page 50, page 51. Subdivision agreement, page 76, page 77, page 78. Wells, page 56. Conservation authorities, 63 through 67. That kind of a map ties in with those pages of addresses which you will find in pages 63 through 67. Navigable waters, page 62. Corp status, we have two, Ontario, page 79, and Feds, the, um, page 80. Drainage Act, page 54. Environmental Protection, pages 61 and 70. Highways, pages 68 and 69. Farm Loan, I'm dying to use that one, page 73. The Bank Act, page 74. And residential tenancies, that's an addition to your material. That's page 80, bracket A.